There have been a lot of questions sent in. I will have chosen some of those questions. We're going to examine the questions, not the answers. It's a dialogue. <coughs> you ask a question, and the speaker replies to that question. Then you respond to that question. You ask a question. The speaker then responds to your question. Then you respond to the, my, the speaker's response, and so keep this going till only the question remains and not the persons. Right? You've understood this? Probably have not gone into this question of dialogue. I think it's important to understand this because we are together going to investigate these questions. And in the process of investigation, you ask the question, the speaker then replies to that question, and you respond to the reply, and then I pick up and reply to that till we go on this way, till the only question remains. You understand? So the question then has tremendous vitality, it's not tinged by any personal prejudice. Have you understood this? We're going to do it, we'll see it for ourselves. I wonder why we ask questions and whom, from whom do you expect a reply? It's good to ask questions. More questions inquire, the better. But we expect someone else to answer the question. The question is really a problem. A problem is something, the root meaning of that word, is something thrown at you. The etymological meaning of the word problem means something hurled at you, thrown at you. It's a challenge. And we expect others to solve our problem. Religious, economic, social, all kinds of problems that human beings have. And therefore it becomes one sided. You ask the question, and the speaker replies to it, if he's silly enough. But if we together investigated the question, the significance of the question, and not move away from the significance of the question, then the answer is in the question. Right? You understand this? Most of us put questions, then wait for somebody to answer it. So what we are interested in is in the answer and not in the question itself. Whereas the importance is in the question, not in the answer. You will discover this presently. Because this is a question put to the speaker, then the speaker responds to the question, then you pick up that response and reply to that response, and we keep this going till 
the question remains, and not anything else. And when the question becomes extraordinarily important, it becomes, it has its own vitality, and therefore its own answer. We'll we'll see it in a minute. I understand that all people have a similar consciousness, but seems a vast jump to say that all people share the same consciousness. Could we walk together slowly between these two points? This is a question put. What is the significance of that question? The questioner says, I understand that all people have a similar consciousness. What do we mean by understand? I am not being facetious. Hair is pretty. But I would like to know what you mean by understand. I understand the nuclear bomb will kill 10 million people at one blow. I understand it. I've seen the experiment, not be 10 mil- million people blown up, but seen the mushroom cloud and all the rest of it. Is the understanding merely intellectual, verbal, or the understanding has tremendous significance, depth, and not merely Verbal understanding, right? I've asked that question. Then you reply to that question. You say, no. When I, say, when I use the word understand, I don't mean logically, but, or merely verbally, but I understand it, the meaning, the significance of human. Co- of people have similar consciousness, right? But it seems a vast jump to say that all people share the same consciousness. Could we walk together slowly between these two points? What do we mean by consciousness? You reply to me. There are too many people, therefore I'll reply for you. <laughs> we mean by consciousness to be conscious of things, conscious of the, the trees around here, people around here, in their various dresses and hair, and so on. I I'm aware. What? It's all right, sir. She's perfectly all right. She's quiet. Will you be quiet? Yeah. What do we mean by being conscious, being aware? In that awareness, see what is happening around us and the happening or the mere things as they are, and in that awareness there is a certain choice. I like, I don't like. I like oak trees, I don't like palm trees. Or I wish it was something else. So there, in this awareness there is a sense of choice. Now is there an awareness 
which is part of the consciousness, in which there is no choice at all. So the speaker puts that question, and the speaker representing you answers that question, which is, in our awareness, there is always choice. Choice being I like, I don't like, I wish it were different, and so on. So, where there is choice, there is a conflict, right? Right? Do we see this? Where there is a choice between this and that, this division brings conflict. Now, is there an awareness without choice? Do you understand my question? As you cannot reply, I think I am taking a part. It seems that it is very difficult to be aware without choice. And the reply to that is, why? Why is it difficult? Is the word difficult preventing, throwing a barrier? The word difficult. You understand? You, you understand? When we use the word impossible, difficult, I am a failure, those words act as a barrier. So, in using the word difficult, you have already made it difficult. So, is it possible to be aware, conscious, without any choice, just to observe? Right? And the reply to that, I will try. And to that reply, I will try, the speaker says, don't try. The moment you try, you are making an effort. And when you make an effort, you don't understand anything. Whereas if you don't make effort, but just see, perceive the actual, right? And again you say, sorry, I don't understand it. So I say, let's go into it further. I am having fun with this. <laughs> I haven't read these questions before. I like to look at them first when I'm speaking. So, but it's a vast jump to say that we that all people share the same consciousness. Is that so or not? That all people throughout the world share the same consciousness. Is that so? And you say, no, there, it is not the same. Each one of us is different. Each one of us has his own peculiarities his own idiosyncrasies, his different environment, different um, religious upbringing or non-religious upbringing, educated in different ways. So all consciousness, the, we do not share all the same consciousness, you reply. And the speaker says, it's not like that. Let's look into it. Don't assert. Don't take a position. Then you can't, then it becomes a battle. But if you don't, if you are pliable, move, inquire, then we, we are together in this. So he said, now let's examine this very closely, 
without any bias, any ta taking up any position that I, I believe in this, then you can't discuss, you can't explore. So, let's examine this. And or you say, what do you mean examine? Explore. What do you, who is exploring? Your own attention. I'm not using the word interest. Now we must go into the question of interest and attention. I hope you're coming to this game. Most educators are concerned with interest, awaken the interest of children, students. Be interested in mathematics. If you are not interested in mathematics, be interested in history. The teacher is concerned with awakening the interest in the student. Right? Isn't that fact? You play. I want to play the violin. Don't play the violin. Be, it's not worthwhile because you can't earn a good livelihood, but you get interest in something else, and so on. Now, where there is interest, there is always a contradictory process going on within oneself. Clear? Oh no, really? <laughs> All right, I'll explain again. I am interested in climbing a mountain. And my teacher says, That's, don't be interested in that, be interested in much, something much more serious. There is a contradiction immediately. I am interested in climbing, wanting to climb the mountain. And the educator said, don't climb the mountain, be interested in what I am saying. So in me, there is already a contradiction takes place. Wanting to do something else, I've been forced to do something else. Right? So, don't use the word interest at all. Then what word would you use, you ask me? I say, find out what is the nature of attention. Are you all so puzzled by all this? What is the nature of attention? The student is very interested in watching something very closely. And I want him to be interested in history. But he's watching the frog or the lizard or the bird out of the window. He's paying much more attention to that than to listen to my demand of history. So I would encourage him or help him to watch much more carefully. You understand? Much more carefully. So that his whole attention is given to his watching. When he does that, then I can See and demand that he pay attention to everything slowly. Learn to, to pay attention, not interest. You got it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, let's examine or explore that we all share the same consciousness. Wherever we live, whether in the Far East or in the Middle East or here, human beings go through terrible times. There's great poverty in Africa and India and parts of Asia. There is great suffering. The people are anxious all over the world. People are afraid all over the world. 
And they all want security, both physical as well as psychological. Right? Right? This is a fact. So the fact is common to all of us. Right? You suffer. The, the Indian in India suffers. The Russian suffers. So human beings taken looking at all the, the inhabitants of the world go through this extraordinary phenomenon. Right? All human beings are have their own idiosyncrasies, their own way of doing things, their peculiar habits, their fears, their gods, their beliefs, their right through the world, this is common factor. This is so, right? I, the, I, the speaker says so. And you say, no, it's not like that. I am different from my neighbour. The speaker then says, are you really? You may have a bigger car, a wider garden, beautifully kept. You work at that garden. You may have a bigger house or a smaller house. Right? But this superficial difference, both biologically and physically, is natural, it is there, it is a fact. You are tall, another is short, one is very, very clever, the other is not, and so on. But go beyond that, go, or go below that, which is in the psychological world. In the psychological world, we all share the same sorrow. Sorrow is common to all of us. You may have pleasure in one way, but it's still pleasure. It's still fear. You may be afraid of the dark, and another may be afraid of some other thing. But fear is common to all of us, right? So we all share the same consciousness. And you say to that, it sounds very logical, but is it true? Is it a fact or are you, are you making something to be a fact? Because you want to bring about non-individual existence, which is unreal. So I said, listen to what I am saying. Are you an individual at all? Factually, are you? Because you have a different complexion, different upbringing. You are a Catholic, I am a Protestant. You are a Buddhist, I'm a Hindu, and so on. Externally, you're different. Obviously, that's a fact. But inwardly, are you different? Please. I say, yes, I'm quite different. What makes you say that you are different? Is it because you think you are different? Or is it a fact that you are different? You understand? Thinking is one thing and the fact is another. Thinking about a fact is something di totally different from the fact. The fact is, are you different? Not that you think you are different. Psychologically, inwardly, 
we cheat, we lie, we, or we, we want success, we want money. This is a common thing to all human beings, right? So we are saying there is no individual consciousness. It's not your consciousness. And you say, I don't believe it. <coughs> it's your invention. I said, look, when you call yourself an individual, what is the meaning of that word individual? Meaning. The root meaning of that word. It means indivisible. Right? Are you indivisible or fragmented? You understand? If you are fragmented as you are, you are not an individual. Don't use that word. You are a fragmented human being. Like all other fragmented human beings. Individual means unique. You're not. We'd like to be unique. We think we are unique because we're clever, we are this, give, you know, which is a form of vanity. So, when you examine it very closely, unbiasedly, without any sense of egotism to this, you find. We are, we are humanity. We don't share the same consciousness. We are humanity. I wonder if you understand this. When you hear that statement, either you accept it as an idea, or Hearing that statement, you make an abstraction of it and say it's a good idea. Right? And you say you are avoiding the fact when you make a, an ideal of the fact. Right? So please look at the fact. That all, every human being in the world goes through all kinds of problems, misery, unhappiness. And if he's a clever man and wants to earn money, he does all kinds of crooked things, you know, the whole game. And we all do the same thing in a different way, but the, the motive, the urge is the same. And you reply to all that, yes, I follow it all logically, but I can't feel the, the depth of your statement that we are humanity, the feeling of it. I, then the speaker says, why? Why don't we feel this tremendous sense of wholeness in humanity? You understand? Not that we share the earth, um, the earth is our mother, and we're all born, etc. Et I know that's the latest fact, yeah. another fad in this country. Realize this? We move from fad to fad. The latest box we we fall into. So, if one can look at the fact and not make an idea of it, 
or an abstraction of it as an idea, but remain with the fact that we are really the whole of humanity, psychologically. Then that feeling, when you remain in the, with the fact, it gives a, a, a sense of tremendous energy and aid. There is no separation in this. Let's move to the next question. <coughs> Good Lord, have you designated a special teacher or a person to carry on your teachings of to your God? Someone is claiming this position. Have you designated a special teacher or person to carry on your teachings of to your God? Where? <laughs> Someone is claiming this position. I wonder why he's claiming this position. <laughs> I know this is happening. I know the various people that are doing this kind of rubbish. But what are they claiming? Why do they want to follow somebody, after somebody? Suppose, not suppose, K is going to die. Speaker is going to die, that's certain, as all of us are going to die. That's one absolute irrevocable fact, whether you like it or not. And fortunately or unfortunately, he has said many things, written some books, and become somewhat May I use the word notorious? <laughs> notorious? <laughs> Not as a criminal, <laughs> but some kind of freak or religious teacher, another freak, or some kind of biological exception. And because of that, a sense of reputation in the world, which is so ugly, and it has no meaning, reputation. The, someone wants or feels or be, urge, thinks himself is going to carry on case work. Why? Probably should very profitable, <coughs> both financially, and then you can say, well, I mean, I can collect a lot of silly people. This is happening in the world. In the church, the apostolic succession, you know, handed down. There have been two in India in a different way. So we all love authority. We all want to follow someone who says, I know. And we are all so gullible. We never say, look, I, I just want to live. I want to find out what you say, what you are, not what you represent or your sim symbol and all the rest of that, what you are. And you begin to doubt, question what you are. And you should discover it's nothing very much. So. K is saying, the speaker is saying, he has designated no one, no teacher 
or anyone to represent after he's gone to England. <laughs> Which is going next week. It's all rather silly, isn't it? <laughs> what do you mean by observing thought down to its very roots? I watch my thoughts, but each one leads to another in an endless chain. What is the factor that ends this? What actually brings change? What do you mean by observing thought down to its very roots? I watch my thoughts, but each one leads to another in an endless chain. What is the factor that ends this? What actually brings change? I just will answer this question, we'll stop this back and forth. One of the questions is, can thought be aware of itself? I am, one is thinking about what? what you will do when you get home. You are thinking what you will do when you get back. And you want to find out what think that th what is the quality of that thought and can that thought be aware of itself, you understand? You understand my question? I am thinking of my next meal. Now, can thought be aware that she's thinking of the next meal? Or is there an observer who says, I am thinking about my next meal? You understand? Right? Is the observer different from the observed? You understand? Is it different? Or both are the are thought? Isn't it? The observer is thought. And that which he is observing as thought is still thought. So, the observer is thought. The observer is all the accumulated memories of the past. Right? What? And the observer then says, I'm going to watch my thinking. I'm going to watch what I think. I want to find out the root of my thinking, right? The observer is saying this, but the observer is also thought. So two thoughts, one thought is watching the other thought. So the common factor between the two is thought, right? And what is the root of thought? That's the question I see. What is the root of it? What is the root of all our thinking? Because we all think. The greatest sc scholar, great scientist, and the most ignoramus, the most 
primitive person thinks. So what is the root of thinking? And when I've, is it possible to find the root of thinking and is it also possible not to think at all? We're going to go into all that. If I ask you a question, what is thinking? What's your reply? Probably you'd say, I've never thought about it, I've never gone into this question. And I say, why not? Because all your life is based on thought. Business. Everything you do is based on thought. Why, why aren't you interested in finding out what he's thinking? What's wrong with you? You explore great so many things. Go under the sea, you go in the air, you do all kinds of things, exploring. But you have never given your energy or your urge to find out what is thought. And you say, Sorry, I've never done it. And so I, we say, Look, Carefully observe what thought is first, what it does, what it has done in the technological world, and also what it is doing psychologically, what it is doing in its relationship to others. You follow? This whole movement, the technological world, what is happening psychologically inwardly and what is happening in your relationship through thought. This movement of thought from the extreme technological world to the personal psychological world and the relationship between the psychological world and the next person is the same movement. Right? Thought. Now what does it do in the relationship between you and another? Right? What does it do? You say, I don't know, because I've never thought about it. Even if I thought about it, I don't know how to go into it. And you leave it like that, hoping somebody will come along to explain the whole thing. Which means that you are not, forgive me for pointing out, you are not really concerned. If you are concerned, you will work at it. You are concerned to earn a livelihood, and you jolly will work at it. But here we say, sorry, this is. I'm used to this. All my parents, the past generation upon generation, are used to thinking they've never gone into this question at all. And so you brush it aside and go on. Whereas if you begin to apply, look, perceive, committed to find out, you must find out. Then you say, why is, is it that I can answer certain things very quickly, instantly? 
other things, I take time. Right? So, instant response, taking time before response, and ultimately saying, I really don't know what you are. I don't know. Right? These are our states of thinking. Instant reply, taking time to respond to a question, thinking, looking, watching, asking, reading about it, and then say, this is the answer. And the other is, say, I really, I don't know. So these are the states we go through. Now, when you answer quickly, you are familiar with it. It's every day. You know the way to your home, you know the way to turn on the heater and so on, wash dishes. But you, if I ask you, if I ask you something much more complex, you take time. And if there's a question, like is there eternity? You say, I don't know. When you say, I don't know, either you are waiting for, you, for somebody to tell you, or you don't accept anything from anybody, but say, I don't know. Right? So let's examine what is the root of thinking. Please, you must work at this, otherwise there's no fun in this. Just to listen and say, yes, it's so, and walk off. But to just apply, find out, go into it, then it becomes extraordinarily interesting. Thought is surely memory. Or rather, response of memory. Right? If there was no memory, you can't think. That's obvious. If you are in a state of amnesia, you can't think. So, what is memory? Please, you are working, I'm not. Just don't listen to you. are working to find out. What is memory? You're dri- when it's driving a car, going along, and you look in another direction, you have an accident. Oh, not you. I, I, I'm having an accident. And that accident causes pain and all the rest of it. So that accident has been recorded. In the brain, right, as memory of that incident, right. So that is that <coughs> accident has brought certain knowledge, right, and that accident has been an experience, right. So that. Accident is an experience which has brought knowledge, right? And that knowledge has been stored in the brain as memory, right? And the response to that memory is thought, right? That's simple. So, my experience is limited, my knowledge is limited, my memory is limited, so my thought is limited. Right? This is a fact. So, whatever thought does is limited. Whatever it does, 
whether it imagines there is the eternity, is limited. Whether God, invented by thought, <coughs> that God will still be limited. I can give him various attributes, say he's, he's omnipotent, he's all powerful, all compassionate, but he's still limited because the thought has put him there. Right? So, th- so thought is limited. Right? Do you do you do we see this fact? Not my explanation of the fact, but the fact that thought is always limited. Because it's based on knowledge. Knowledge can expand more and more and more and more. When there is more, there is still more. You understand? More is a measurement. Right? So the more, which is measurement, and that measurement is limited. Whenever you, I say, I am better, it's limited. Right? So thought is limited. And all our actions based on thought naturally must be limited. Clear? That's a fact. Now, what does limitation do? When I am thinking about myself, which is very limited, I spend all my days thinking about myself. That limitation creates trouble for somebody else. My wife, my husband, my children, because I am thinking about myself, which is very small. So. Any action that is limited must bring conflict. Right? My country is small. I may, the country may be enormous, many thousands of miles across, but my concept of my country is very small. I can imagine it's large, but it's still that imagination saying it's very large, it's marvellous, it's still limited. So, that limitation is creating conflict with another limitation, with the greater limitation, or the, which is your common enemy now. (laughs) So it goes on. (coughs) So, do we see this fact that limitation must create division and therefore conflict. And we have accepted conflict as inevitable, as part of our existence. And we never asked, is it possible to live without conflict? And it is only possible if you understand the whole significance of thought, and to find out what is the rela- what place has thought and where thought has, n- has no place at all. You understand? Thought has a place. When you go from here to your house, drive a car, drive a letter, do your business, the computer, and all the rest of it. Thought is there, is necessary. And in the psychological world, is it necessary at all? Which is my relationship with another. Go into it, sir. Work it out. My relation, your relationship with another, intimate or not, has thought a place. Knowing that thought is limited, divisive, 
therefore conflict. If you see that as an actuality, not just a theory, a concept, then you see, then that very perception, the seeing of it, then relationship means something entirely different. Right? You and So one asks, then much further, which perhaps this is not the moment, what is, is love an attribute of thought? What is the relationship of love to thought? Has it any relationship? Or not? Or no relationship at all. We'll go into that and we'll talk about all this. But the question is, what's the root of thought? And whether thought can bring about a change. Please understand, this is the question. The fact what is the factor that ends this, the continuity, chain continuity? And what actually brings change? Can thought bring change? This is, you understand? That which is limited thinks it can change. And therefore, when it tries to change, it will still be limited. I don't wonder if you see all this. This is not clever, logical conclusion, but actuality. There must be change in human behaviour, human endeavour, human existence. It's obvious. But when thought organises the change, the change is still limited, therefore no change at all. When thought says, I am going to create an organisation, the, the new world, the, what have you, the new box you invent, that is created by thought. Therefore, that organisation, that foundation, that institution is limited and is going to create conflict. Right? So what is it that brings about change? We are following all this? Somewhat at least. Thought of Obviously cannot. It can organise change. Organisation is put together by thought. It can plan change, but the planning is limited. So when one realises, sees the fact, the truth, that thought cannot possibly bring about a change, because thought itself is limited and therefore whatever it does is limited. Right? Therefore what will bring change? Go. The thing is laid before you very clearly. Verbally, the description is accurate, not exaggerated, and it's left to you to answer that question. As thought cannot possibly bring about change, mutation, total psychological revolution, then what will? 
So thought says, yes, God, I'll pray. This is happening. I'll pray. See, prayer again, invented by thought, therefore very limited. So if you can, un- if one sees the fact, the truth, that thought is absolutely limited, then what takes place in the brain? Also, examine what when I, when you, when I real, when one realizes actually. The fact, and the enormous fact it is, it's a tremendous revolution to see the fact. Already revolution has taken place when you see the fact. Because we never said thought can do anything. It can. It's gone to the moon and put a silly flag on there. <laughs> you can do anything, but always limited. If you see that revolutionary fact, there is already a mutation of the cells themselves on the brain. I do wonder if you understand this. So, one has walked all one's life north, going always north, suppose. And you come along and say, oh, sorry, that leads nowhere. Try going east, or west, or south. And I say, yes, I'll go south. The very movement which you have been going north has now suddenly changed going south. There is a a mutation taken place. A change has taken place. You know, the one you have been going north habitually day after day, day after day. So the brain is conditioned going to north. Now you come and say there is nothing there. You explain logically saying. So he said, quite right, I go south. That movement away from the north is has brought about a mutation in the very brain cells themselves. Right? You won't accept this, you go into it, you will see it for yourself. The realization of a truth, that very realization brings a radical change. There is not, I will me- meditate to change. Or you make an effort to change. Please explain what you mean by saying that if one perceives truth and does not act, it acts as poison. Do you need explanation for that? All right. I have heard the truth that thought is limited. That's the truth. That's not an invention. That's not an exotic idea, something conceived by some idiot or other. It is a fact. And I listen to the fact the truth of it. And I carry on my daily life. What takes place? I've realized something to be true and I'm acting quite the opposite to that. 
what happens? Conflict increases more and more and more. It's much better not to hear the truth. Then you can carry on in your old way. But the moment you hear something to be extraordinarily beautiful, and you don't, and that beauty just a mere description of, but the actuality of that beauty. Then you do something ugly and keep on repeating doing the thing ugly, it's obviously a poison. It not only affects you physically, inwardly, but also it affects a great deal the brain that has heard something to be true and that's the culture. Therefore, it's much better not to hear, if you want to carry on your old way. There's a very good story of four robber, robbers, oh, two robbers, as many. And they've been robbing, and their father has been praising God for, their, for his kindness for their benefit. Thieves have also gods, not the only rich people. So one day they have been robbing somebody or other and are coming back. In the patio, in the square, palazzo, piazza, there, there is a man <coughs> saying, giving a sermon. And he's saying, you must never steal. You must never hurt another. Be kind. The other brother closes his eyes, ears, doesn't want to hear. And the other brother hears it. And for the rest of his life, he's in pain. I think this is a fact, really a great fact, if we don't, we don't seem to realise it. That when you see something enormously beautiful, you see, you have, you are sensitive enough to see that beauty, and you do something ugly, it really tortures you. If you are sensitive. And that's why truth is such a dangerous thing. Why is the observance of silence so important for seekers of truth? Why is the observance of silence so important for seekers of truth? Who said this? Who said that the observance of silence is necessary to perceive truth? As the speaker said it, or some other person said it, or have you searched for truth and you have discovered silence is necessary? Is truth can be searched? You understand my question? Can truth be searched, sought after? If you seek truth, you have already established what truth is, right? You are already moving in that direction, which means truth is something fixed, 
and you, in your search to truth, you find it. Because you are laid, truth is already preconceived and you go after it. Now, why do you think silence is necessary? I don't know. Somebody says so. So I'm not going to. Sorry. So I'm not going to listen to another, however reputed, have great reputation, all that nonsense. I'm going to find out. Can a chattering mind, brain, chattering, ever listen to anything? You are chattering, talking to your friend, and you come along and you say, I want to tell you something. You, you don't listen because you are chattering. So in a, can a chattering mind listen? Obviously not. So to listen you have to pay attention. Right? It's natural. To pay attention is rather difficult because we, we never attend to anything completely. We say partially listen, partially talk, partially do this and partially. We never proceed to find out anything to its very end. I don't know where the end is, but we go on till we discover something. So. Can a chattering mind, can a mind that is occupied from morning till night, or and during the night, can it ever be quiet? Not to find truth, good God. It's an ordinary question. Please answer this for your oneself. Brain that's occupied with business, with sex, with pleasure, with fear, with its loneliness. You are occupied with something or other. With its hair, how it looks, how it doesn't look. You know, all the rest of it is occupied. With God, with Jesus, with saviours, with meditation, think of that, being occupied with meditation. So the natural question then is, is it possible to stop this tr tremendous, endless continuity of occupation? It will be natural to stop when you are attending to something. If you are attending to what the speaker is saying now, attending, which is listening, you are, you are not occupied, you are listening. But in that listening you say, no, I don't quite agree with that. I think you are right. I think you, are, you should put it differently. I understand this differently. Why do I understand it differently? And so on. But if you actually listen, you are attentive. And attention is silence. Right? It says, I wonder why we make everything so complex. Life is complex, tremendously, like any, like the computer is a tremendously complex thing. But to understand it, one must have a very simple mind. To have a simple, clear mind, uncluttered. 
then attention becomes extraordinarily simple. That's not for today. Right. It's over.